Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, James. How are you today? I'm great. How are you doing? Um, enjoying life as always. I'm sitting down with Jeff Irvine today from the basic course, and I think you're just one of two basic course instructors we have for the resident phase. That's that's correct. Um, with the reorganization and the movement of some instructors, there's a small portion of us that will be uh, conducting resident. The rest of the people within the Army have the opportunity to do the, the basic course online. Okay. And how long have you been teaching the basic course? I've been here since the conception of CES in uh, 2006 and helped design the original courses that uh, are presently now the basic course with some uh, input on the IC course and the advanced course. Okay, so you've been doing this a while. I have. I had one short break uh, during that time frame and spent some time overseas operating with forces in the Middle East and had an opportunity. Those things that we teach in the basic course about developing teams and uh, working with different nationalities uh, had an opportunity as a as a one of the directors there uh, to apply those things uh, in multi uh, multinational and joint forces operations. And uh, yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. I just came off of a developmental assignment as well, working up at our three star headquarters, the CAC headquarters, and it's and it's good to have the opportunity to try and operationalize the the concepts that we teach our own students in the classroom. And uh, I, th- I think yeah, it'd be nice if more of us could get out. The yeah. operational environment and, and see how these things work. Yeah, yeah, and I really believe in you know you can teach things, but unless you go out there and apply them, and ha- you get a better understanding of that, and with that ability to go out and apply what we've learned, I know that the principles that we're pushing in the basic course, which is a direct level leadership course, is right on track for accomplishing the mission, influencing people. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about about, about the basic course. Um, Let's see, where should we start off in talking about the basic course? It's two weeks long, the resident phase. And uh, typically in our seminars, typically have, what, 16 students uh, for you guys? Yes, normally 16 students uh, from all wa- from all uh, career fields and all locations uh, that the Army has, Army civilians, which really mirrors what the Command and General Staff College does for the majors who are here for 10 months. Uh, they have 16 people in staff groups with all different – um, skills and job titles in uh, foreign officers in those classes. So we really mirror what the majors are getting through the uh, Command and General Staff College. Okay. Yeah, so as an intermediate course instructor, we focus more on the organizational level of, of leadership. And so as you'd mentioned, then the basic course focuses more on that, that direct leadership and there's a lot of team building, I think, in the curriculum that you guys deliver as well. Is there not? Right. Um, that's one of the key functions. You know, as a direct level leader, I've got to build teams. And how do I do that? And that's the key thing in the basic courses. We spend some time talking about um, how do I, what is a recipe that I can use to help develop high performance teams? Teams that I really want to lead that are, that are, uh, easier to lead in and, and that kind of leads into so these are the key there's five key outcomes from the basic course what's interesting about these outcomes and I'll talk about them in a minute it doesn't make a difference whether I'm at the direct level the organizational level or the strategic level I've still got to apply these just in a different context uh, having a broader point of view when I look at it. You know, like the first one is uh, think critically and understand Army basic problem-solving methodology. You know, as a leader, I've got to be able to understand myself. And to understand myself, I've got to understand how I think, what influences me as I'm making these decisions, and is there a model, a way that I can uh, uh, make decisions and solve problems. And we really focus on the Army seven-step problem-solving model, which leads you into the second uh, course outcome, which is communicate effectively speaking, writing clearly, concisely, and persuasively. Well, when I understand the Army problem-solving model, when I'm communicating how we're going to solve a problem, I use those seven steps as I brief people so they understand this is how 
I th- my thought process was, and this is how I want to solve that problem. And so now I've got a I've got a tool to help communicate that and be more influential because I'm using using Army doctrine to show, okay, this is how I solved solve that problem. What's interesting is at the direct level, I've got to have that ability to speak and provide direction to people. But the other part of that is I've got to work on my writing abilities because as I go up to the organizational strategic level, I do most of my communications through briefings, but a lot of it's through emails and correspondence to uh, large groups of people. So that's a continuous development piece. And we start here in the basic course with them writing their own leader uh, leadership philosophy papers mm-hmm. and give them some, you know, understanding, you know, what is the Army style, bottom line up front pieces. And then that goes into that third piece of the outcomes, which is the, uh, which is understanding and applying elements of effective leader interpersonal skills. This first week in the basic course, you spend a lot of time understanding yourself. Why do I do the things that I do? Why do I believe things to be true? And to help understand how do, what is my learning style? How do I deal with conflict? And just for, for my ability to understand that piece, I've given what we call um, a leader's identity. I figure out where my leader's identity is. A lot of that comes from my own self-reflection, but there's a lot of feedback in the class mm-hmm. from other students of how do the, well, how do, what behaviors did you demonstrate? And then that goes back, goes to that fourth, uh, fourth, uh, course outcome, which understand and apply the basic leadership principles. And it goes back to what what is an Army leader supposed to be, and then what does an Army leader do? Mm-hmm. And we spend a lot of time talking about that. Now, the first week of the basic course is what is an Army leader, and the second uh, second week of the course is focused on what does an Army leader do? to mm-hmm. help develop those teams, and that's where our big focus is. And then the last outcome it deals with um, embracing uh, lifelong learning, self-development, but also to push that self-development to inspire subordinates for self-development. Whether I'm a direct-level, organizational, strategic-level leader, I have got to continue to develop myself, and the people under me I need to continue to develop. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the th- the things that I find uh, in the basic course that it makes no difference what level I'm at. I've got to continue to work on those five outcomes throughout my military career to be an influential leader at whatever level I'm at. Okay. Now, you guys use some instruments in the basic course to help people arrive at uh, what it is that kind of makes them tick or to, to increase self awareness of individuals. What are some of the instruments that you use in the basic course? Well, we focus with uh, COBE learning uh, self learning self assessments, mm-hmm. and then the Thomas Kilman uh, conflict model TKI. The TKI. What's interesting, though, in the uh, the DL portion, if you if you take the basic course non in um, non resident through that, you get to take those two instruments too online and get the results from those instruments. But it really helps you to understand how do how do I learn on the learning styles? But the key thing is the second part of that is now I understand how I learn. Now when I'm spending time as a leader coaching people, I understand this is the way I learn might be different than the people that I work with and that I need to adjust my style so and look at what their learning style is to become more influential when I'm doing coaching uh, with my people. Okay. Well, let's talk about those two just for a minute then. So let's go with Kolb's LSI. What are some of the outcomes that come from that? How many, like in MBTI, there's 16 different personality types that come from that instrument. When it comes to LSI, what are, how many different outcomes are there? Um, there's four different outcomes that we focus on on the basic course. Mm-hmm. 
And those four outcomes really give that student that opportunity to to understand how they see the world, but also how the other three outcomes, when they brief back their findings, how they see themselves. What are Whether those? it's accommodating. Okay, accommodating. To, accommodating. What, what does that mean, really, accommodating? So in, in the context of, of LSI. Um, LSI, accommodating deals with a person who, I want to get the job done. Okay. And I'll... I have less fear to jump right into it, but I might have to redo the project two or three times or change things in route as I'm trying to develop the final solution. But I'm okay with it. It kind of it's kind of like uh, Larry the Cable Guy. Let's mm-hmm. just get her done. And so there's a lot of that uh, focus. I want to get things done, and I want to get them done fairly quickly. Okay. I like to operate. Usually, those type of people like to operate off a checklist, and you know, I like checking things out. So that's accommodating. Now, what's another one? Um, diverging is another learning style, and diverging is more focused on. I want to read and understand, and I also want that to work with people. And so diverging focuses a lot on, I like to brainstorm and see all the different options. And those kind of people are really great when you're sitting down there brainstorming, kind of thinking out of the box piece. Mm -hmm. But once they finally decide this is what they want to do, they, they hold off until they figure out exactly what they want, and then they'll go for it. Okay. Now that kind of goes in... Uh, for the next style, which is assimilating. Now, assimilators like to spend a lot of time gathering facts and information, and they spend most of the time gathering those facts and information from themselves. They like reading it, looking up in the books, and so when they execute execute a um, a mission, uh, it's a one time shot. They just want to get it done right the first time. So an assimilator, what's interesting, though, when assimilators and accommodators operate together in a group setting and a problem gets thrown out, sometimes you'll see accommodators will jump in and start talking because they're really talking, they're really thinking with their mouth. Mm -hmm. And an assimilator is sitting there trying to think with their head. But if I don't understand that people are accommodators and assimilators, I might get a misperception that that assimilator who's thinking, trying to figure out what information they need, well, they're not participating. They're not taking part. And so I could get upset saying, well, they don't care, when in actuality, they're thinking, except for they're thinking in their head, where an accommodator is thinking with their mouth. Okay. And then there's the converging. And on the converging side, they're more let's get her done, but they're more focused on they want to get the facts and information to decide what what is the best course of solution, and so they figure figure that piece out. What makes them different between an accommodating learning style is accommodators gather information and facts, but they they gather it more from uh, getting information from other people. We're converging. They like to do a lot of their own research, and then they set their goals and move forward. Okay. Interesting. And so I think with those type of instruments, once we learn a little bit about ourselves, we can also learn to appreciate some of the differences in the way other people operate. To, I think just for some people to realize that not everybody is like me, and, and that's okay. In fact, I, it, it, and, and I think in high-performing teams, it, it's beneficial to have people who have different uh, modes of operating. Yes, and I agree with that. What What's interesting, what I really like about the basic course is also people find out that there's other people like me. Some people have a fear that, oh, I'm just different because I don't operate the same as those other people. Well, in the basic course, when you're operating with 16 different people and we take that instrument and they divide up, they go, hey, there's people just like me. Mm-hmm. So besides understanding other people, it also reinforces that, hey, I'm a good person. I, you know, I I can, I think, but I just think in a different way. I learn in a different manner. Okay. 
And then when we look at, um, we'll kind of move on to the other one now, TKI. Mm-hmm. Uh, how many different outcomes are there with the TKI instrument? Well, on the TKI, there's there's five different um, preferences. And this, and I'm going to go back to the LSI for a minute, the okay. learning styles. These are preferences. This does not mean that that is just because that instrument said that you have this preference does not mean that um, that's the way you are. You have a choice. And in certain tasks, you might change your preference to be more influential. And that leads us back to TKI. It provides where my preference is when I'm dealing with conflict. But that preference does not mean that that is the only way I deal with conflict. And depending on the situation, I change when I'm dealing with conflict. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the modes for dealing with conflict, they call it avoid or withdrawal. Mm -hmm. And avoid and withdrawal is an effective way to deal with conflict when you're dealing with uh, situations where maybe people's feelings, tempers are pretty high and there needs to be kind of a cooling off period so we can think about this. Mm -hmm. You know, the other one is competing. Now, competing deals with, I know what I want, and I'm going to go for it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to really compete for that. Now, there's some advantages and disadvantages, but as a direct level leader, that is one mode that I might have to do, especially when decisions are unpopular, that I have to go, okay, we're going to do it this way. I know you don't want to do it this way, but this is the way we're going to do it. The other mode is again, called accommodating. But that is the relationship is more important than just what we're having this discussion over. Right Now, an, an example would be, uh, I want to go out to dinner with my wife. I really don't care where we go out to dinner at. I just want to be with my wife. So if she says, I want to go to dinner at this place, I'm fine with that. The bottom line is, um, my purpose is, hey, I'm on the relationship's important, and I'm going to spend time with her. Right. So sometimes that gets looked at as a person that doesn't, um, you know, doesn't care. Yeah, I care, but I'm caring about something a little bit different, you know. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean I'm wishy-washy either. I'm just, I my goal is, hey, I want to spend time with somebody. Okay. And then the other one uh, is compromise. And compromise is a win lose situation. I'm going to get some of the things that I desire, but I'm going to have to give up some things to achieve that desire mm-hmm. and with that other person. So that's one of the other uh, uh, modes. And then the last mode is collaboration. Now, collaboration, what I find is collaboration is a win win situation. But collaboration does take time. Right. And takes, I'm going to achieve my goal, and that other person I'm collaborating with will achieve their goal. I think a great example of collaboration is you see senior officers and you'll see SESs doing this collaboration with other organizations. Each organization has to achieve their mission, but if they both can achieve their mission, they can achieve a higher goal. I think that's where you'll see uh, memorandums of agreement between organizations. Right. Each organization gets what they want, but there's a higher goal that they've developed. Okay. So those are the five modes of conflict that we spend some time talking about in the basic course. And that helps us get get my leader identity clear. Um, I once saw somebody who had developed their own model for conflict resolution from the, the Thomas Kilman index, the TKI, and kind of written it on a, on a three by five card. And they take it with them wherever they go. And I don't know if you've seen this before and that you've got two axes. Uh, w- on one axis, you have the importance of the relationship. And on the other axis, you have the importance of the issue. Have you seen this? And then you draw a quadrant. So you got a quadrant. So in the quadrant that's down low where the importance of the relationship and the importance of the issue are both low, just avoid, withdraw. It, it's not worth it. And then as you move up to where the issue may be important, but the relationship isn't, 
maybe that's a time where, where you can compete. Now, as we move up to where the relationship is important, uh, but the issue isn't as important as you mentioned the example, you know, where to go out to eat, with, you know, with your wife. Uh, that's where we need to um, accommodate. And then when it comes to where both are important, the issue is important and the relationship is important. That's where we need to uh, collaborate. And then in the center of it all, though, if you kind of draw a quadrant in the center, you would have the compromise. There's always room for compromise in any of these things. I kind of have to look, but as uh, it's kind of the was so kind of the hub in there to, to look for, but you kind of have to decide, is this a place to compromise or do I need to compete? Do I compromise or do I accommodate? And uh, for some people that say, you know, I have no idea how to deal with conflict resolution. I, I just, it's a simple little thing to draw a tool. You can draw a three by five card and pull it out. You know what? Is this a situation where the relationship is important and the issue maybe not? So, okay, here's what I'll consider doing. I don't know if you've seen that mm-hmm. applied that way. Yeah. And I think that's an effective tool. You know, once I understand myself, then how can I use that tool for that situation to achieve what I'm trying to achieve? And knowing what your preference is on where you tend to go most of the time. You're right. In the next episode, I continue my conversation with Jeff Irvine as we discuss the self-development domain and the content process model. What am I doing today to help that person feel significant? And what am I doing today to help that person feel competent? To get what you talked about earlier is I want commitment. That's next time on the AMSE podcast. And we welcome your feedback. Please write us at usarmy.lovenworth.tradoc.mbx.amsc-podcast at mail.mail or you can just write us at amscpodcast at gmail.com.